Welcome back. So I suspect you've just watched the previous two videos on smoothing this week, but there's a, a definite uh, storyline that we don't want to lose. And so I'm going to do a quick recap of what we covered in those previous two videos. So the, the, the basic problem is uh, I've observed some y's that are assumed to be some function of x's plus some, some uh, uh, errors. And so this, this could be uh, the picture that we're looking at. So I've, I've observed all these points and give yourself some nonlinearity here. So maybe the curve flattens out a little bit. And so I have those axes and there's a true function out there, which is this f. So this is my true f, but unfortunately, I don't get to observe this. Okay, so my, 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 the, my goal is to come up with an approximation. I want to learn an approximation to f, and I'm going to call that f hat. Now, we talked about a couple approaches. I think I need to make this a little bit wider if I can here. Um, we talked about a couple approaches to this. And we're, we're building up to, um, you know, a, a really good estimator. And what we have is actually not bad as, as it is, but um, the first thing we said was we could do a bin smoother. So why don't we take uh, the entire domain and just chop it up into some bins? And then, you know, this is going to be called this bin one. This is bin two. And this is bin three. So my, my, uh, my estimated function, so f hat at x, then is just the simple average of all the points in the bin. So I think that, that would be my, my bin smoother estimate. And we said, well, you get the, you get the step function, and it's, um, I, I think the adjective I used was it, it was too steppy. So we, we would expect a nice uh, smooth curve, and we have, the, we have these... Um, these, these, these hard steps with, with, with pointy edges. So that's not very good. So then we, um, I, I, we went to the nearest neighbor smoother, which said, don't fix your bins. Instead, what I want you to do is for, you know, a, a given X that you're trying to estimate, find a window and just average the points in that window. Uh, and we just, we have this moving window that, um, you know, is just the average of the points that fall into the window. And that was, that was a big improvement over these, these bins. Now, where this video is going to go is um, kind of a different approach to improving the step function. So the way to think about this other approach is let's build off the bin smoother. And I have a, a, a local function that I'm fitting in each bin. So, so the way to think about my grand f hat at x is there's really some function here. Let's just call that function f1 at x. And f1 at x is actually just a constant. Let's just call it beta 1, where this height is beta 1. And then in this bin, I'm going to give myself another function. So let's just call that f at 2. So f2 at x is maybe the value beta 2, and so the height here would be beta 2. And then in bin 3, I have another function that's going to be called... You know, let's stick hats on all of these since they're estimated functions. So these are going to be... Um, uh, you know, my f hat at 3 will be beta 3 where this height is beta 3. All right, well, what I've done, so, so don't, don't lose track of kind of this big idea that I'm fitting a function locally in every bin. Now, this function that I'm fitting is extremely simple. It's, it's just an intercept model in each of my different bins. So you might start to think, could I improve on this by fitting a more complicated function in each of those bins. And so let's, let's just take this up a degree. So instead of fitting this, uh, the, the, this piecewise, you know, you could call this a piecewise constant model. 
So let me just write that down. The bin smoother is equal to a piece wise constant model. So every chunk has a constant function. Well, what's the natural thing to do? Why don't we fit a line in each of these bins instead of this very simple constant function? So um, if, uh, I'll use a big red, red marker here so that we can see it. And let's just say I fit a line to all the points in bin one. So there's my, my, uh, my, my first function. And then I'm gonna fit a separate linear regression line in the second bin. So maybe something like that. And then I have another line out here in the third bin, which I think would look something like that, which coincides almost with my, my uh, bin smoother. And, and so what I have here are three lines that I stitch together. And what I, what I hope you'll agree is that that is way better than this piecewise constant model. We'll, we'll, I'll, I'll just use orange here to show that. Um, it, it's way better, but not perfect. You know, I've got some sharp elbows here uh, at each of the corners. Now, you could think about where could we go with this to take it, make it even more, you know, uh, smoother. Instead of fitting a line, we could fit some sort of a second or maybe even third degree polynomial in, in each one of these bins. So I would fit a cubic here, a, fit a, a cubic here, and fit a cubic in the third one. And I've got pink here for, for that function. And it would look something like this. And uh, this is what we're going to call a cubic spline. So the, the pink line is a cubic spline where I put a cubic function in each of these bins, and that'll be my next video. Um, this, uh, the red version is, is what is called a piecewise linear. Um, you could call it a piecewise linear spline. So, so I have uh, a linear function in each one. Okay, so that's a different way to take this, this whole idea of, of fitting local functions uh, and improving on it. So one, uh, one approach would be my local averaging has to be um, in, in a neighborhood that moves, and that would be a big improvement over a bin smoother. This approach is to fit a more complicated function locally to get a better estimate. So that's where we're going. Now, the question is, how do I make one of these piecewise linear splines? So, so, so remember what I want is I want a line here and I want a line here and they have to match up um, at, at the boundary, at the not boundary. So the not boundary, let me just, um, I'm going to write that up here. This not boundary is called a knot. K-N-O-T, a knot, knot, all right? And so we want this line to match up with this line at the knot. And I want this line to match up with this line at the knot. Well, if we go to the next page, this is the piecewise linear um, uh, function. So I'm going to start out with the absolute simplest um, situation and then we're going to build it up and, and make it more complicated. So this is the, um, is, is the equation. Well, uh, let, let me go back for a second. And he, here's the situation I'm going to assume. So, so I want the, the absolute simplest case. And the absolute simplest case occurs when I have a single uh, knot. All right, so there, there's going to be a cut point C1 and let's just uh, put it at zero. So what my real problem is gonna be is I wanna approximate some function over an interval, and I'm gonna call this end C0 and this end C2. So this is my bin one right here, and this is gonna be my bin two. So I, so I have uh, bins one and two, 
And so I'm going to have a function f hat 1 at x that works in this first bin. We're going to have an f hat 2 at x that works in that second bin. All right. So the, the equation that works is what I, what I put off uh, in, in the course packet. So, so let me just write that out. So my grand f at x, f hat at x, is going to be, so what is x plus? x plus is going to be this function right here. x plus is equal to x for x greater than or equal to 0. And it's going to equal 0 otherwise. And so the way x plus looks is something like this. This is my x-axis. And uh, let's go do this in red so that you can see it. So for all x less than 0, x plus is equal to 0. And then for x greater than zero, we have a 45 degree line. And of course, at x equals to zero, uh, x is equal to zero, or x plus is equal to zero. And so, so this is the f, the x plus uh, function. So I'm going to just draw two lines. Here's one. Here's my knot. And here's my other line. And so make sure that the slopes aren't the same for this, um, this picture. Now, um, let's go look at my function up here and evaluate this function for x less than 0. So really, I want something in, um, in this first bin. Uh, but you know, all the points in this bin are less than 0. So if x is equal to 0, then f hat at x is equal to, well, beta naught plus beta 1 times x plus beta 2 times x plus. But since x is equal, x is less than 0, what is x plus? It's 0. So let's just multiply that by 0. And this whole term is equal to 0. So the way um, I'm going to write this is, you know, this equation has, um, is f hat 1 at x equal to beta naught plus beta 1 times x. So if we interpret this, the y-intercept is beta naught. And then the slope of this line, so let's say we go one step to the right, the slope would be beta 1. So that's our interpretation of this, uh, this left part of my grand function. Well, let's go to the other side. So let's say that we have an x that is greater than or equal to 0. doesn't matter where you put the equal sign since... Um, uh, notice they, they, they meet up here. We'll see that they meet up there. So let's go compute our f hat. You know, we could stick a 1 there if you like, and we could stick a 2 here if you like. So what is half f hat 2? Well, this is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 times x. Nothing changes. Plus beta 2, but now I have to multiply that by x plus. Well, what is x plus? x plus is just x, so I'm going to write, write it just like that. That's x. We, we don't need the plus if I plug in the definition. So this is equal to, well, beta naught plus, I'm going to factor out the x, and we end up with beta 1 plus beta 2 times x. So this is a different line, and the equation of this line we'll just call this f hat 2 at x, then is what I just wrote downstairs. So beta naught plus, well, beta 1 plus beta 2 times x. So what's the intercept? Well, the intercept of this is still beta naught, and therefore uh, these two lines meet at the naught. So the k and o t. Um, what is the slope? 
Well, for a one unit uh, change in x, the slope is going to be beta 1 plus beta 2. And I'd like to point out a very uh, important interpretation about beta 2. So note, beta 2 is the change in slope at the knot. So um, th th this, this has an implication. So this implies when beta 2 is equal to 0, um, the, um, the line is completely straight. Or you, you could also say the elbow is not bent. Okay, so this would be what that picture looks like. So I would have some slope here. Call that slope beta 1. And then if I, if I here, here I've, I've hit my knot. And if I carry on, what is the slope over here? Well, it is beta, no, beta 1 plus 0. <laughs> because the change in this is zero. So my, my line is straight, the elbow is not bent. Um, let me just draw another picture for us. Suppose I had a situation like this. Here, beta two would be less than zero. So I have a positive slope up until I hit the knot, and then all of a sudden the slope decreases a lot. So this would be beta 2 less than 0. This would be beta 2 equal to 0. And my picture up here is where beta 2 is positive. So it's, it's very interesting um, to see how that works. Well, what do we do if we, um, if we want to have more than one knot? And the answer is, you can have, well, two things. N number one is, what happens if I don't want my knot at zero? And question two is, uh, how do I have more than one knot? You know, so maybe I want to have a knot at one and a knot at two, like I had with my sine wave function. So this, um, this is the general uh, expression to achieve that. So you take x minus the knot value. So this is how far I am away from the knot plus. The way to interpret this is any value x greater than the knot takes the value x minus c, or c sub k. Any value less than the knot is zero. Um, so I, I'm going to let you, um, you know, ha having done the, 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 the special case that, that I think is fairly easy to see, I'm going to let you think through uh, this and maybe have you sketch out something on your own with... Um, something with multiple knots. We're, we're going to look at the sine wave um, in, in a second where we, we have a, that, that exact situation. All right, so uh, I want to go over an example with you. This is um, an example from someone who took my class a long time ago, and um, he was a PhD student over in the School of, School of Communications, and he was studying um, civic participation and how civic participation is uh, related to your news consumption. And so uh, he, th this is a kind of a simplified picture of something that he did. And we, we actually ended up uh, publishing an article uh, from this, and it was part of his dissertation. So uh, the uh, whole idea here is we have a news consumption index that is mean-centered. So zero means you have um, average news consumption. All values greater than zero are have above average news consumption. These are people who are uh, have below average news consumption. And so his theory that he wanted to test was that news consumption has a greater impact on you if you're a what, what he called a news avoider than if you have a news hound. So the people off to the right are, are news hounds because they consume a lot of news. 
So what we realized was this spline model was the perfect way to test the hypothesis that he had. You know, so if news has more effect on your civic participation, that's like voting and going to uh, community meetings and all that, um, then you'd expect a steeper slope here than here. So um, what we ended up doing was fitting exactly the simple model that I just went over with you. And so here are the parameter estimates. So, so let me uh, go back to this scratch pad and just write out exactly what my function is. So you, you could say, you know, your, your predicted value is equal to 0 0.208 plus 0.104 times the, um, your news consumption. So X is your news consumption. I'll just write that in here, news. news consumption. And then he has a, uh, a term that represents the change in slope. So 0 0.079 uh, times x plus, or this news index plus. And so for anybody who is below average in terms of their news consumption, you end up with one line. So notice this last term goes to zero. For anybody who's above average, then this term simply becomes index because index plus is equal to index for positive values. And so if I take the combination of these two, 0 0.104 minus 0 0.079, I get about 0 0.024. So the slope seems to be much less. Now he actually wanted to test a hypothesis for whether the slopes changed. So the way you would do this is test H naught beta two equal to zero, which means no change in slope versus an alternative that beta two is not equal to zero. So there is an elbow. I'll just write that out. There is an elbow. Or maybe I should say the elbow is bent. There is a bent elbow. Get rid of the and then. All right, and so if we look at our T statistic, the T statistic is minus 12. Point nine something or other. Um, which, if you if you were to go look that up in a, a, a T table, actually a normal table would do since the sample size is absolutely massive. That's out here somewhere, minus 12.9. The area in that tail is about 0 .000000 something or other. Uh, so the upshot is I can reject the null hypothesis that this, uh, this slope is zero. This would be the sampling distribution of beta hat two. And uh, we would reject this and conclude that there is a slope, you know, that there is a change in, in the slope. All right, one more thing. Let's go try this approach for our sine wave example. And so th this is how I, um, how I can estimate these piecewise linear terms in R. So I'm gonna put a knot at one and another knot at two. And when I do that, uh, re remember, here was that general form. You're gonna take x minus the knot plus times the slope. So the way you can do this in R is you, you have i, i just means evaluate what's inside of the parentheses, x minus one times x greater than one. So this, expression right here, x greater than one, is gonna to evaluate to true for all x values greater than one and false or zero whenever it's uh, less than one. So in other words, this term is gonna drop out whenever x is less than one, otherwise it's gonna to evaluate to the value x minus one. Likewise with this other one, but the, the not will be at two. So let's, um, Let's go over to my, my piece of paper here, and, and I'm just gonna sketch out what we, what, what's going on here. 
So I have X and I have Y and I've got two knots. So this is, you know, following my notation, we could say C1, knot 1, or cut point 1, is at 1, cut point 2 is at 2. So C2 is equal to 2. Now, let's go um, evaluate the function that I get in each of these regions. So I'm going to have a function f1 hat at x here, f2 hat in this region, and f3 hat in this region. So what are these, what are these f1, f2, f3s? Well, um, I'm just going to go write it out. So f hat 1 is equal to 0 0.09 Nine one. It's it's this number right here. Uh, plus the slope. So one point zero eight times x. Now what I want you to note is you know I'm assuming um, for for this function x is in the interval zero to one. Okay, so if x is in zero to one. What I want you to note is this evaluates to false or zero, and so does this. So both of these terms evaluate to zero. So it's going to be x minus 1 times 0 times minus 2.3, but because you, you, you put a zero in there in that product, the whole thing vanishes. So you could say plus 0 plus 0 if you want. I'm just going to draw a line here. Um, and so that is the, the, the line, so it's something that would have an intercept of 0 0.091, and it would have a slope of about 1. So 1.08 is actually the slope. All right, well, that was, um, that's one of them. Let's go to bin 2. So in bin 2, we have x in the uh, region 1 to 2. So what is my equation there? Well, f hat 2 at x is going to be this. It's just going to be f hat 1 at x. So you could copy this part down right here and stick that in right there if you like. And now we have to worry about this next term. So x greater than 1, well, x is clearly greater than 1. Um, so this is going to evaluate to 1 times x minus 1. So you could write this as minus 2.3. I'm not going to write a lot of decimal places here for us. x minus 1. And then the, the third term, well, x is clearly less than 2, so this, this whole thing goes to uh, 0. So the third term drops out. Now we could write this out. So, so I, if you want to write it out, uh, it's going to be this, 0 0.091, so that's my old intercept. Now if I take minus 2.3 times minus 1, I get plus 2.3. So that is going to be um, the, the, the intercept. That will be the intercept of my, of, of my next line. So just it's, bear with me for a second. Um, then what we end up with here is going to be, let's just say plus 1.08 minus 2.3 times x. So this is minus 2.3x plus 1.08x. And so I think that's about minus 2.2ish. So I end up with something that goes down. So the slope here for a one unit change this way is minus 2.2. And if I were to continue this on, not that I would ever do this, this is my intercept, which is not that interesting, to be honest with you. Okay, but the point is, I now have, um, you know, a, 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 uh, an, a very sharp elbow. That negative coefficient um, right here, actually this should be minus 1.2, not minus 2.2. Um, that's what happens when you do math in your head. All right, but the, the, the slope is definitely negative. My picture's right. I, I just did the uh, math wrong in my head. All right, what about my third function? So f hat 3 at x. So remember, 
This is where I'm off in this third bit. So x is in the window 2 to 3. So what happens? Well, if we go look here, I get the old intercept, I get that x, I, I, you know, nothing changes here. So, so let me just write this as something like uh, f hat 2 at x. But now all of a sudden I have to worry about this third term. So let's go write that in. It's going to be minus 2, minus 0 0.20 times x minus 2. So what we could do if you want to write everything out is it's going to be what I had before for my intercept, 0 0.91 plus 2.3. Now I got a minus 0 0.2 times a minus 2. So that's going to become a plus 0 0.2 times 2. That's that term times that term. So I'm just going to kind of write that down. That's where that, that's where that stuff is coming from. Now, my, um, my slope is going to be, well, 1.08 minus 2.3, and then I have a minus 0.2 um, times x. So, in essence, my slope is going to get a little bit steeper in the negative direction. So, it's going to, this would be if I just carried on the line it's going to be a little bit steeper. Um, and that would be my fitted function. Now, if you go look at the plot, um, this is the real um, function that I fitted very you know, carefully in R. It, it looks straight, but it's not straight. We know that the, at this elbow, the, um, the elbow is slightly bent. Uh, we could do a hypothesis test on it. And we, we can't reject the null hypothesis that the... Um, uh, that the, the line is really straight here, but, um, uh, you know, it, it is, there is a slight bend there. What I hope you um, will agree is that this is a vast improvement over the step function. Okay, so here, here was my step function uh, where I put a piecewise constant function in each bin, just adding these lines has uh, really improved things. All right, that's it for this video. We will go on to the cubic model in the next video.